Hello sailors, this is the Dodger Kebab and you're watching a video that shows the difference between 10 arcade games and their Mega Drive home ports. Some of you watching this call the Mega Drive Genesis. You people are wrong. This is a Mega Drive. And this is Genesis, a 70s English rock band. With that cleared up, let's move on to the first of the 10 games. This is mainly a list of games I just wanted to play again, so here we go! We begin with Golden Axe, the late 80s hack and slash classic. Remember kids, winners don't use drugs. We also get an introduction to the main characters, like Axe Battler and Tyrus Flair. And it's you! That's right, I've been kicking ass since the late 80s. Nice, well either way, you have to select a character. On the arcade version, it looks like this. However, the Mega Drive version lacks the background. The game starts shortly after this, and on the arcade version, you see a wounded friend called Alex get killed by Death Adder's men. On the Mega Drive, you just get a few lines of text, although I'm pretty sure the Mega Drive could have handled an NPC being beaten up. Onto the game, and actually the graphics in the two versions are fairly close to each other. Probably about as close as Catherine Jenner looks like to a normal woman. You wouldn't confuse the two, but you can see what they're aiming for. Although the backgrounds are not as detailed in the Mega Drive version, they do the job. But the main sprites on the Mega Drive do a great job of reproducing the arcade game. The sound is really close on the Mega Drive, thanks to the similar Yamaha sound chips in both arcade and Mega Drive hardware. As for the gameplay, the Mega Drive 1 plays pretty much the same as the arcade. Both games feel the same to play, and that's what makes this such a great port. Now we have Outrun, which is an arcade game that I kept going back to because it's such a joy to play. Thank fuck for emulation. Now, while the arcade game that you can see here is brilliant, the Mega Drive version shown here does have some flaws. Graphics aside for a moment, and the first thing that is noticed is that there's no engine sound. If you're like me, you listen to the sound of the engine so you can hear when to change gear. This is Toilet. So many times I forgot to change gear because I had no audio cue. While we're speaking about the gears, they are mapped to up and down on the joypad to change from low to high. Sounds reasonable enough, but many times around the corner I'd change gear by accident because my thumb moved a tiny bit. And guess what? Because there's no engine sounds, you won't know right away that you've done it. What retard thought of this? The graphics on the Mega Drive port are pretty good. They lack the super smooth sprite scaling found in the arcade, but they get the look of Outrun across. The only thing I'm not happy with is that they got the shade of blue on the sky of the first level totally wrong. It's not that the Mega Drive is incapable of displaying this colour, because look, it's right there on the fucking title screen. Look, Sega, that's the fucking colour it should be. You have it right there. Why on earth did you get it so wrong? The sound on the Mega Drive version is fine. The version of magical sound shower found here is as good as I'd expect the Mega Drive to be able to do. For those of you that think it sounds bad, no, it sounds okay. Okay, the Master System port sounds bad. But you know what? At least they got the right colour of the sky in that version. Believe it or not though, there are a couple of things that are actually better on the Mega Drive version over the arcade. The first and most noticeable thing is the prancing horse logo on the back of the Ferrari Testarossa Spider. In the arcade, the horse is reversed when the back end of the car points right. That's because Yu Suzuki is lazy and mirrored the sprite that shows the back end pointing left. In the Mega Drive port, however, this has been fixed and the famous logo is correct no matter which way you turn. The other thing that's been improved on the Mega Drive is the scoreboard. On the Mega Drive, I can enter my name as Kebab, so there is a five character limit, but the arcade version uses the traditional three character limit, so I have to live with just Cab. Street Fighter 2 needs no introduction. You all know this game, so let's get on with it. The arcade version had a cracking intro with notable music. The Mega Drive version is the same, but with one huge difference, which I'm sure you spotted right away. The people in the background have more animation frames on the Mega Drive. Well, okay, th there is that, but that's not the difference I mean. The clouds in the sky have parallax scrolling in the arcade, but don't on the Mega Drive. Right, that that's not the difference I mean either. It's the guy's sleeves on his shirt. On the arcade, his t-shirt is normal, but in the Mega Drive version, they're rolled right up to his shoulders. I don't even think we can call this Street Fighter 2 with a difference like that. But really, this is still a great game on the Mega Drive. Sure, the graphics 
are taking a hit due to the lower resolution, that's obvious. Look at Chun-Li on the different versions. On the Mega Drive, she might as well be made out of Lego. But it's still just as fast, just as smooth, it still has the same scrolling found in the arcade. I don't think the sound is that bad either. This port always gets shit on by people saying the SNES version had much better music. I don't think so. Round one, fight. Voice samples, sure, the Mega Drive samples as rough as arseholes, but the actual music here is pretty good. The main thing though is that this still plays like Street Fighter does in the arcade, and as long as it does that, it doesn't matter how high the characters roll up their sleeves. You remember Commando, right? No, not that commando, the other one. No, the fucking Capcom game from 1985. Well, five years later, Capcom made a sequel called Mercs. This classic has the all-star lineup of... Joseph Gibson, a man who forgot to take his gaming headset off and sports both a blue gun and a pair of braces. Howard Powell, a man also unaware of the benefits of body armour and may actually be Geese Howard from Fatal Fury. Finally, Thomas Clark, a man who is instantly forgettable and may actually be Clark Steele from King of Fighters. All three of these men must shoot everything that moves in the arcade version to make it to the end, but not in the Mega Drive version though, they it's only one player, so fuck you. As for the game itself, the Mega Drive version is actually really close to its arcade counterpart. The graphics are recognisable and do a great job of capturing the look of the original game. Some things have been cut though, like the helicopter that drops you off on the beach at the beginning of the game. This has been changed to a boring old fade-in. The music is really well converted too, but it's hard to even hear the arcade music because the volume level and the sound effects is too damn high. On the Mega Drive, they've actually lowered the sound effects volume and I think it's a more pleasant experience in the sound department because of it. Best of all though is the gameplay from the arcade versions being reproduced to a high standard on the Mega Drive. It plays well although I think it's actually harder than the coin-op version as dodging enemy attacks is that much harder. Virtua Racing is the most influential racing game of all time. Before this Pretty much all racing games were sprite based like the brilliant Chase HQ or the equally great Cisco Heat. You did have a couple of three dimensional racing games like Atari's Hard Driving or Namco's Winning Run, but these were seen as very early tech demos rather than viable new ways to create racing games. In 1992, Virtua Racing changed everything. It showed that 3D polygon technology could be used to create viable gaming worlds in which every Every other game before it looked prehistoric. This game's importance cannot be overstated. It didn't just pave the way for more racing games like Ridge Racer or the amazing Daytona USA to move from 2D to 3D polygon graphics, but it caused the entire video games industry to make the same moves. Fighting games like Street Fighter 2 made way for games like Virtua Fighting. Doom's clever 2D sprite scaling engine made way to Quake's real 3D polygon engine. And the same can be said for almost every every genre of video game. So with a game this big, this important and this good, how did the Mega Drive conversion turn out? My eyes are burning. Okay, by today's standards, it's not a pretty game. But back in 1994, this was utterly cutting edge and way beyond anyone's imaginations of what the Mega Drive could be capable of. But that engine noise is still just as god awful today as it ever was. Yes, there is a big drop in polygon numbers, but the game still resembles its arcade father. Probably the biggest loss in translation is that the fairground must be broken on the Mega Drive as it doesn't move like it does in the arcade. Too Crude or Crude Buster if you lived in Japan is a game with very little consistency in its intro. First off, nuclear explosions of unknown origin have hit New York. One, there's only one explosion 
version two it's not unknown where it came from it's right there I can see it. Next, the massive Metropolis was all but destroyed. Quickly forward to the title screen, and if you ask me, it looks like New York is doing fine. Anyway, you're crude. Raphael is cool, but crude. Give me a break. And you need to bust the heads of all the gang members. So you've got Crude Buster. Unless I have it totally wrong, and really it's David Crude and Kevin Buster. And we were just one bad marketing decision away from this game being called Kevin and Dave. Either way, this guy doesn't look like he's ready for fighting. Comparing this section on the arcade to the Mega Drive and it looks like the home port is actually off to a good start. The Mega Drive version has music that the arcade version does not, so we're doing well. The actual game in the arcade version has nice, chunky, trademark Data East graphics. You know the sort, like you'd see in Magical Drop, Bobocop or Jar Mag. What I like is that this is a post-apocalyptic world, which is really bright and colourful, not like that drab, dark, dingy world you see in Fallout. Although maybe it's the graffiti that brightens the place up, although some of it is a tad weird. I mean, here we have banana, cyber, and choose between death or disc lots. Okay, moving on. Once you make it to the fallen Statue of Liberty, you come up to the first level boss, which is like a mashup between Sting from wrestling and Jake the Snake from his crack den. For most game designers, that would be enough, but not Data East. That's not how they roll. They went a step further and added in ladies' heels. You fucking nailed it, boys. Nailed it. Trap him in the corner and you can just destroy him. So, did the Mega Drive version come out okay? Well, I have to say this, they made a good job of the music, it's pretty close. The graphics though have lost a lot of their arcade charm. They still look like what they're meant to, but without the large colour palette, it all looks a bit dull and a bit boring. You can still tell what the game is meant to be, so I guess in that respect it's okay, but a whole lot less enjoyable to play when it looks this bland. As far as the gameplay goes, it's a lot harder than the arcade version. These pricks that fire off whatever the fuck these are meant to be, always seem to get you every every time. And these little midget assholes always keep draining your health by nibbling on your nipples. Wait, what? Well, that's it, that's it, I'm done. Game aka Mula, aka Ghouls and Ghosts, aka Hard as Fucking Nails, is a side-scrolling platform game with a spooky theme to it. It's also the sequel to Ghosts and Goblins. These two games are pretty similar, although in the first game it has some tasteful animation frames. <laughs> Ghouls and Ghosts is a fun game even though it's pretty hard. Some of this difficulty was lowered when the Super Famicom version was released because now you have a double jump. But the slowdown in this version just was terrible. The Super Famicom just doesn't have the power that the Mega Drive does. So let's look at that version now. I think the graphics on the Mega Drive look really close to the arcade and the music is pretty decent enough too. Everything here looks, plays, sounds and feels like the arcade version. So Capcom did a great job porting this. Okay, it's probably not the most amazing demanding on the hardware, but it's still a great port either way. I say it's not that demanding, but it clearly is if you don't have blast processing. <laughs> I love me some Rolling Thunder 2, it's a really fun platform shooting game from Namco that's got a great style of graphics to it and really catchy music. The intro tells us of the year 1990X, satellites are mysteriously being destroyed. Ah, oh, I remember the year 1990X, Coolio was top of the charts, everyone was using Windows 9X to troll each other on newsgroups and the game of the time was funky headboxes on the Sega Saturn. What a time it was to be alive. Anyway, some people panicked, some other people had a meeting, which led to lots of tanks and a giant skull because reasons. Because of all this, you have to go through various levels shooting down bad guys. The main mechanics is that you can jump to higher and lower platforms easily and go indoors to avoid bad guys or pick up items. Sounds simple enough, right? Well, one bullet is enough to kill you. That's right, just one single shot from an enemy is enough to cost you a life, so you have to be quite sharp while playing this game. The first level is approaching the enemy base on a coastal route. Second is inside the base. But as we move over to the Mega Drive version, first of all, we can see they've changed the intro for the better if you ask me. I think this one is far better. You also get a quick introduction to each level now in the Mega Drive version. The first level is still the same coastal stage, but the second level is totally different and instead of being straight into the enemy base, you now have to clear the grounds of the base before entering. As far as the game goes, it's still the same tight control system, the music isn't quite as funky, but the graphics are done pretty faithfully. The main thing is that the game is just as enjoyable on the Mega Drive as it is in the arcade. Sure, there's been a bit of a change around with the levels, but it makes no real difference to the fun and the new presentation 
resolution is great. Now, if there was one game that you wouldn't ever expect to see on the Sega Mega Drive, it's this, Virtua Fighter 2. This is a classic one-on-one -on -one fighting game from 1994, although now it looks like all the characters have been mutilated with potato peelers. This was cutting edge back in the day. To play it now, it feels quite chunky and awkward, not like how Virtua Fighter 5 is today, that glorious motherfucker. But Virtua Fighter 2 was an important game for its time, and like I said, it was totally cutting edge tech in 1994. So, how did the Mega Drive conversion turn out? Why did they even bother? Come on Sega, I know you had a hot IP, but this is just an embarrassment. You think it's bad looking at this on, on a YouTube video now? Think of the poor sap in 1996, walked into his local video game store and saw this and thought, I love Virtua Fire 2, and now I can play at home on my Sega Mega Drive. 40 quid you say? Fucking done deal son. They take this game home and find out they didn't get this, they ended up with this piece of shit. How fucking gutted would you feel? To be fair most of the moves are here and it does vaguely feel like Virtua Fighter but this was a bad idea from the start. When the Sega Saturn was being pushed to its near limit to get this game running what hope did the Sega Mega Drive ever have? Finally the last game on the list today is Super Monaco Grand Prix. In the arcade this was normally played in a cabinet which I always thought looked great. Well I think it was the cabinet I liked. I was nine years old at the time, so it could have been the girl on the title screen. Anyway, this is a sprite scaling racing game, much like OutRun, but this was far more technically impressive. You race around and it's easy to think that Sega crammed in a load of official sponsors into the game, but look closely, it reveals otherwise. You fancy a nice cold hostas, or do you want a satisfying mulber bow? Maybe your car could do with a top up at that mo deal. Either way, this is a lot of fun to play, and we'll was around just at the right time for the Sega Mega Drive conversion. How did Sega get on with it? Well, I will say it plays really smooth. This is probably due to the fact that there is fuck all scenery. Hey Sega, you know that arcade game that looks great, that has a lot of detail? You fancy putting some of that in here, in this game? You know, instead of nothing? Well, actually, you got the tunnel sections pretty close. That's because it's pretty hard to fuck up when all you need is black. This game really does control well, but the lack of anything to look at but grass as you go along really kills the feeling of the arcade game. Oh well, at least it wasn't the car crash that the second game was. Good evening, Ayrton Senna, three times world motor racing champion, has died after crashing during the San Marino Grand Prix.